Welcome back, everyone. Just wait for ASL to get up before. Ah, welcome. All right, thank you for coming back or welcome to Common Ground uh, 2021 Encouraging Advocacy. We're so happy to have you here with us. Um, my name is Alyssa and this is Jessica. Uh, we are your hosts today. Um, I just want to, um, if there's anyone new on the, on the call, um, we're talking about self-advocacy today. Uh, we're going to thank our sponsors, um, Anchor, Ascot, and Everest Reed for helping us put this on today. So thank you so much to them for their generous, generous sponsorship. Um, if you are here and hoping to get um, continuing education credits or professional development credits for your time with us, um, you can, or you will hear a code word at some point during each session. Um, you can email that code word to windreach at windreach.bm um, at the end or throughout along with your profession. And we will then send back uh, your certificate with um, your continuing education um, credits. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to Jessica to introduce our next speaker. It's my absolute pleasure. Uh, Alex, Bush, Alex Bush is a clinical psychologist with over 40 years experience of supporting people with intellectual disabilities. He worked at St. Brendan's for five years in the 1980s before returning home to Sheffield, England, where he had a variety of clinical, managerial, and strategic roles. He returned to Bermuda in 2015 and resumed working at Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute in the Intellectual Disability Service. He was heavily involved in the work of the Sheffield Learning Disability Partnership Board, which was co-chaired by a self-advocate. He was chair of the Learning Disability Professional Senate in England, and in that role, sat on the committee chaired by the UK Minister of Health, advising government about the direction of services for people with intellectual disabilities. This committee contained more advocates and self-advocates than clinicians and managers. It provided excellent example of effective advocacy at work. So please welcome Alec Bush. Thank you very much. Just making sure that the, the systems were up and working. Um, I just hope my wife's not here today. We were told that we had to wear purple uh, as the, the, the color of the, uh, for the International Day of Disabled People. And the only shirt that I could find that vaguely resembled purple was a very old one. So um, apologies, um, and I hope my wife's not watching. Um, what I want to do, first of all, is to share my screen. It always takes a little bit longer to do this than you expect. Okay, there we go, there we go. Um, yes, I'm, I feel very honored to be here. Um, it's a, a, a very, very special day uh, with the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Um, I had the, um, the opportunity to watch the motorcade uh, leaving from uh, Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute just now with, uh, well, about two hours ago, um, with Minister Tine Furbert, um, giving the, uh, the send-off uh, very, very powerful uh, speech that she gave. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk about growing and supporting self-advocacy. I want to spend a little bit of time, you know, just being clear what we mean about self-advocacy for somebody with intellectual disabilities. Um, Ashley gave, uh, well, both Ashleys this morning gave very powerful uh, presentations about how they, um, as disabled people, have managed to uh, advocate for themselves in a variety of different settings. Um, it's that very often it's much harder when somebody has uh, an intellectual disability. And I want to talk a little bit uh, today about some of the things that 
can be done to uh, help uh, that process. I'm going to talk a little, a little bit about uh, some of where it comes from uh, within very much a framework of person-centred planning and we'll spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about that. I then want to try and present a bit of a model uh, talking about how self-advocacy operates at different levels. Um, and some of what I'm going to be arguing is that you need to provide people with opportunities to exercise personal choices, individual things that affect them as individuals. In order, you can't then move on to the next levels, which are influencing the service that supports you or changing the systems, uh, which is a, a next level up, next uh, level out. Um, if you haven't been able to exercise, uh, enable people to, to make personal choices. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some examples of how that might be done. I'm going to share with you some tools uh, to support self-advocacy, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, exercising personal choices. Um, and then to talk a little bit about uh, looking at the, the systems level at uh, how we use co-production uh, as a vehicle for trying to uh, make changes to services. And then I'll also be talking about um, some of the cultural things, some of the things that need to happen within organisations if we are genuinely going to be looking at co-production uh, and self-advocacy. And I'll try and give some, some practical examples of that. Um, within the, the mental health field, uh, this would be very much known as the recovery model. Um, it was interesting uh, listening to Ashley this morning talking about the social care model uh, and the medical model and other models. Um, the, within the field of intellectual disabilities, we are very familiar with the, the social model. Um, but within mental health services, the same model is often known as the recovery model. So although I'm going to be talking about people with intellectual disabilities, um, very much the same, the same sort of principles uh, apply also to uh, people um, with mental health uh, needs. One of the things that I think is particularly important uh, is that we do have hear the voices uh, of those people whose voices are not powerful and we had some really good examples this morning uh, from uh, both Ashley's talking about uh, how they have used their voices uh, in very powerful ways but we're also talking about people who maybe have no verbal communication at all or only very limited ver verbal communication over lunch, we saw some examples of, of how people can self-advocate in the, in the film. And I want to move that on uh, another step, particularly for people with quite significant levels of intellectual disabilities. Um, so how do people with very limited communication manage to self-advocate? Um, advocacy is one option. Uh, advocacy where somebody speaks for them. Um, often that is parents uh, who will very much be seeing the world through the, the child, their child's world through their own eyes. But I also want to move on to say, well, actually, even people with very limited verbal communicate can make very limited verbal communication can still self-advocate. -ad we need to look at ways that we can enable people um, to, we need to be able to listen to people's voices. Um, and there's the adage that if they can't come to the table, we need to take the table to them. And I want to look a little bit about just uh, what some of that means. Um, it requires a cultural change, an organizational change. It requires commitment. And these things uh, are not always uh, there. Um, again, I think we heard some examples uh, from Ashley about some of the, 
the frustrations she had experienced in uh, trying to make things happen if there isn't an organisational will uh, to change that. So we need to be looking at person-centred planning uh, as a mechanism for making that happen. So I'm going to show a very short clip of person-centred planning in action. Um, I suspect we'll get some adverts at the beginning. I'll try to move those very through very quickly. Oh, yes, it does. Uh, good afternoon, Alec. I don't know if you can hear me, but we can't see your video. I think you may not be sharing your screen. I will stop. I will stop that there. I gather you. You can't. I gather people were unable to to actually see the uh, that uh, clip, which is um, unfortunate. But um, I think if you saw the videos uh, this morning, you will at uh, lunchtime you will have had a a good uh, opportunity to uh, to see um, what was meant by um, person-centred planning. So let, let's. Let's return to the presentation as soon as the slideshow lets me. Okay, um, so self-advocacy and person-centered planning really employ very similar principles. Um, and the basics of it are that you need to be able to hear the person's voice. That often means uh, very active listening, um, 
going out and seeking ways that you can hear what people are saying rather than just assuming that uh, unless they can actually speak uh, that they can't make their, their views known. Um, Behaviour is one very good way of um, hearing people's um, voices. It's a system that takes account of people's needs, their thoughts, their concerns and their opinions. Uh, and that's most important. It's the, the opinions that, uh, that are very often uh, ignored uh, because let's face it, we know best. It identifies people's aspirations, um, can help to mobilize other people to help them to pursue those uh, ambish, their ambitions. There's a concept we use sometimes with in-person centered planning called the North Star. Uh, all of us might have our dreams. You know, I, I have dreams that uh, uh, maybe about uh, wealth, about comfort, about good health those might not be actually realizable for me um, but I might be able to do something that might be my north star I can then do something to lead myself to that to guide myself by that north star it takes has to take stock of the person's overall quality of life and to look at ways in which their quality of life can be improved um, it also explores the person's strengths, their past achievements, their current needs and wishes. Um, I was struck by something that uh, Elisa was saying uh, uh, in her presentation when she was talking about how uh, the teachers needed to tap into what, what her uh, strengths were rather than focusing on the things that she couldn't do. Most importantly, people need to be able to make choices about what is important. The whole part of growing up independence is about, is about making choices um, and then turning those choices into goal setting and ways to help people to achieve those goals. Um, it also provides an opportunity to advocate for positive change when in person centered planning you have people who are all saying that they need to have more activities it's ever so hard to uh, to then resist uh, those opinions there's some research findings uh, i've included at the the end the reference to it um, but some of the research findings uh, concerning person centered planning are that for it to be effective, there has to be a very strong commitment of the facilitator to carry out person-centred planning. They need to have the skills to be able to do it. Um, it was a concept that was I was, became familiar with in the late 80s, early 90s. And initially, people were just put in the position of saying, right, you're the nurse on this ward. Uh, we're closing the hospital. Um, you need to become a person-centred planner. And they were just set off uh, on their way. And of course, they just didn't have the tools to do it. They were not individually committed uh, to what they were doing. Um, and we learned very quickly that there had to be a very, um, uh, very detailed skills uh, um, lessons for them uh, to be able to deliver person-centred planning. There has to also be personal involvement of the focus person in directing their own meeting, um, that they need to be, we, we would very often physically place them um, in the chair at the head of the table. Um, sometimes we had people that didn't want to come into the meeting, were a bit phased by having lots of people there. We literally placed an empty chair there uh, and talked to the empty chair as if the person was there to just try and make a focus that this is about this person. They might not physically be in the room, uh, but this is about them. Um, they also need facilitation to be a key part of their role, not just uh, added on, uh, but to actually make it happen. 
if you are facilitating somebody's uh, person-centered planning meeting on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, there is somebody covering you so that you can actually go and do that. The re early research also showed that people are less likely to have a person-centered plan if, surprise, surprise, if they have autism, if they have mental health problems, if they have emotional or behavior problems, they're the people that are most likely to slip through the net because in quotes, it's too difficult. Um, also people that had significant additional health needs or restricted mobility, they were often people that did not initially uh, have access to person-centered planning. So, this model that I was talking about, um, I, was, I was debating whether to make this as a, as a triangle, like a sort of Maslow's hierarchy or, or a circles. Uh, and I decided uh, to go for the circles. Um, the idea that if you drop the pebble into the middle of the pond, uh, the ripples will move out. So at the very center of that, um, the very individual level uh, is personal planning, um, being a, enabling the, th the person to be able to make choices in their lives. Once the system has got some expertise and some culture that says that, yes, this is important, we can then start moving out uh, into uh, using some of the skills that people are developing, have developed around making uh, their needs known moving out to how the service supports you until finally um, as that becomes more expert moving out at to uh, a, a more of a systems level um, there are different forms of person-centered planning of um, individual plans uh, that that have been developed in different places. Um, they all have the same objectives though. They are all person-centered with the person uh, at the heart of what's going on. They all have to understand the person's unique ways of getting their message across. And this again was something that Elisa was, was talking about uh, an hour ago. Recognizing the person's individual communication style uh, and their communication needs so that they can actually be heard, recognizing the, uh, that some of their behavior, uh, it's not about behavior problems, it's not about challenging behavior, it's probably them communicating that they are not happy with something that's going on in their life at the moment. All the different systems understand the person's abilities, needs and interests. And again, it's a message that we've heard uh, already that it's about doing things with people, not to or for them. It's also looking at what's important from their perspective. Uh, and that can be very different uh, from a parent's perspective, a staff member's perspective. Uh, it's most, absolutely essential that we're looking through the lens of the person with intellectual disabilities. We're aiming throughout all this to look at what sorts of support will be needed to enable the person to have the best possible quality of life and to make help them to make decisions and choices about what's important in their lives. And finally, it is very much an ongoing process. It's not a one-off meeting. It's continuing to make sure that we are ratcheting up uh, what, what we are trying to do to support that person in ways that is important to them. So let me quickly give you some examples um, of some, some of the individual approaches. Uh, again, uh, this is in the references at the end, so we can look at these later. Um, but a personal preference indicator, and I'll look at it in a second, but that's basically a tool to help identify what is important to the person. If they are verbal, they would certainly be very much involved, but also it's about the skill and the perception 
perception of the staff member or the parents um, who is advocating for that person if they haven't got verbal communication. We use uh, the concept of person-centered passport. Um, it's, there are very, there are several different versions of this. One we use um, ends up probably about 15 to 20 pages long with details about how the person likes to be supported. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. Equally importantly uh, are behavioural support plans. They're probably not what most people would uh, initially think about in terms of uh, self-advocacy, but they set out strategies to reduce the likelihood of behavioural concerns from the person's perspective. And until you have got the person's perspective, the behaviour support plan is not going to be effective. There's also uh, other examples, um, a one page profile that is sometimes used in home settings uh, where carers are supported by an elderly person. Not so much applying to somebody with an intellectual disability, but certainly um, uh, for other groups of people uh, to be able to make sure that their needs and, and uh, wishes are known to the people caring for them. For some people, um, potentially even a power of attorney, a living will, could be another example um, of ways in which there is uh, self-advocacy. Um, if somebody is able to express what they want uh, later on in life. So the personal preference indicator, um, it basically provides cues it's not it's not a checklist it provides cues to help uh people that are looking after someone or caring for somebody uh, to find out what is important in that person's life they this particular model has seven areas that they look at um i've highlighted in red one that i'll look at in a minute just to give you an example um of of what's uh, what it looks like but it basically asks questions about what does the person like most? What do they like and not like? Um, provides a, a list of potential things, um, music, food, activities, being left alone, being busy, uh, as prompt questions for you to think about, uh, about what, what, in your, what have you observed that this person seems to most like? if they're not able to tell you themselves. The social world, how do they communicate? How do they show affection? What in relationships are important for them? How does the person make choices about daily life? Even if they can't speak, what can you tell from facial expressions um, uh, about the way in which they are making choices about what they do and do not want to happen? Um, are there particular times of day when people like to do things? Are they better in the morning uh, or the afternoon? What do we know about their health needs? And most importantly, how do we know when the person is in some sort of distress? Um, it is amazing how often uh, people are finding that they they are in some discomfort, pain, they cannot tell you what it is, but their facial expression uh, will tell you. And finally, what's the person's involvement with the family or other uh, people, important people in their life? So uh, an example of the feelings one and some of the questions uh, that would, would be included there. Um, these are just some of the some of the sorts of questions, but asking so what part what calms them? Um, why does it seem to calm them? And again, that question why is particularly important because if we if we know why it calms them, we're probably in a better position to know what we can do to avoid them needing to be calmed uh, in the first place. And then some prompts around holding, rocking, 
sights, different smells, music, contact, etc. Uh, if the uh, caregivers uh, are not able to immediately identify what calms them. What makes the person happy? And again, how do you know when they're happy? What is it that you see? What's the facial expression? How does this, their uh, communications alter uh, when they are happy? And what are some of the, uh, those activities? What motivates them? What, what, what sort of things do they like to do? Uh, what is it that, um, that you can uh, grab hold of to try and expand the person's uh, life? Most important also, what do they dislike? Uh, and again, how do you know what it is? If we have somebody with autism, then they may have some very specific tactile, sensory needs uh, that um, may be very different from yours and mine. And we need to be aware of exactly what it is that, that they dislike. Um, some of the people in, that we are supporting have some really unusual likes and dislikes. And it is um, very difficult to, uh, to, to know at times what it is. What do they fear uh, and what sort of coping mechanisms um, uh, do they have? So th these would be just some of the, the prompt questions uh, that if you are trying to get to know somebody and find out what their preferences are, uh, you can um, build on that. Person centered passports. Um, this, this is, as I say, this is what we are using uh, in our group, group homes. Um, they've got about eight or so uh, chapter headings uh, that we, we, uh, we look at. Um, I'm going to look at two of them in a minute, how I like to communicate and how I like you to communicate with me as just some of the examples um, of the way in which we we try to incorporate pre people's preferences uh, into the, the passport. Um, so first of all, I'm going to read you a, a description uh, of Crystal. Um, this, again, coming, coming back to um, Ashley's um, presentation this morning when she was talking about the, the medical model versus the social model. Um, this may well be some of the sorts of descriptions that if somebody was working within the, the medical model, uh, they might be talking about. So we might be saying Crystal is unable to communicate. She's often combative and oppositional when you try to help her. She rarely smiles and her sour facial expression makes it hard to get to like her. She's often attention seeking. She often clenches her mouth and refuses to eat. She's picky about what she eats and you need to be firm with her to help her to eat. That is the sort of description that I hope we don't use today, but certainly I have seen many reports with this sort of uh, description put in it. And when you hear somebody described like that, uh, what images come to mind? Um, you probably have images of uh, somebody who's very argumentative, who's uh, very, uh, un very difficult to, to get to know, um, somebody who's showing that they're angry quite a lot of the time, being quite oppositional, and probably being very sad a lot of the time. Those are some of the images that from that, that description I put up there on the last slide might bring you to uh, uh, interpret who this person is. However, when we look at a slightly different way of describing the same person, um, Crystal, again, these are said in, in her words, she actually can't speak, um, but 
if she did, uh, these would be what we believe that she would be trying to say. I'd like you to speak to me clearly and in a soft tone, although I may not acknowledge you. Even though I cannot speak to you, I'd like you to talk to me and to tell me what you're about to do to support me. I will often tighten my limbs and if you are not making gentle and encouraging physical and emotional contact with me when you are doing personal care, such as changing me or dressing me. This is a sign that you're doing things to me rather than doing things with me. When you realize that I am tightening my limbs, it may help if you say to me in a warm, friendly tone, Crystal, we need to work together. You relax and I can help you to undress. Talk to me while you're doing things for me, giving a running commentary of what you're doing. For example, Crystal, I'm going to brush your hair now. Is that okay? It helps me if you talk to me all the time about the things that you are doing. Keep asking me questions to check that I'm okay and look for confirmation for me uh, by me moving my eyes up or down because Crystal actually uh, communicates uh, yes and no by uh, moving her eyes. That is a very different description to the, the person who was described in the last slide as being oppositional, uh, as being uh, difficult uh, and combative, but it's actually the same person. And it tells you very much how you can support her in ways that, that will help her. Um, that was uh, how I like you to communicate with me, but there's also how I like, uh, I like to communicate with you. And Crystal is unable to uh, speak. Um, we talked in the first slide about being oppositional, uh, that she arches her back and makes guttural sounds. What does that mean? Perhaps that I'm uncomfortable. And what do we want you to do when uh, I'm indicating that I'm uncomfortable? I want you to readjust my position and I check that I'm now comfortable again. When I raise my eyes in my head and smile, I'm saying yes to the questions that you've just asked me. And what do staff need to do? Confirm that you've understood what I'm communicating by checking out, okay, Crystal, you want, to, um, you want me to get you such and such, is that right? So I won't go over all of this, but it just shows you the ways in which you can have a much more person-centered uh, approach and uh, enable you to work with the person much more effectively. We write the person-centered passports in the first person um, and uh, things about, I like to do such and such rather than, he likes to do such and such. Um, they're quite very powerful. The, um, Ashley this morning was talking about the importance of language and by talking about me, I, rather than he or she, uh, helps to present a very different picture of what is going on. We also do it by writing down what I can do for myself and also what I need help with. Arguably, it's virtually the same as what can I not do, but it's a much more powerful way of saying it, uh, to say, what do I need help with, than just to say, he or she cannot. Um, behavior support plans, uh, another way uh, of looking at um, at self-advocacy. Um, the behaviour generally is used to communicate something. People communicate through their behaviour um, when there's something that's, that they're not happy about. It may be that they haven't got activities they want, they might be bored, they might be overstimulated, they might be tired, they might be hungry, they might be thirsty. Um, those are all the possible reasons. And basically, when that person is displaying those behaviors, they are self-advocating, they are showing you 
uh, what they what is wrong. Um, so our behaviour support plans will be written in as green, amber, red uh, support plans. Green, what do we need to support the person in ways that ensures that their needs are met, that ensures that they are happy as much of the time as possible, so that they don't need to be showing through their behaviour that there is something that's uh, upsetting them. We recognise that can't always happen all the time. So if it moves up into the amber zone, uh, what can we do to de-escalate de that situation so that we can help the person to come back to uh, a happy, uh, contented state? We also recognise that those approaches don't always work uh, and that sometimes they will uh, be, have some sort of behavioural crisis. When that happens, what is the least restrictive way that we can help them to return? Here's an example of a one-page profile. There's an old man here, um, perhaps living, living at home, uh, being uh, supported uh, by a carer who comes in uh, to help with certain aspects of their life. Um, as we age, uh, there's even more likelihood that we will need support. And it's important that while people are still able to express their likes and dislikes, that we capture them for ourselves. Um, and a very simple one page profile is just to have something uh, that asks questions that the person themselves completes. What is the, what, what do people like and admire about me? Again, I'm hoping my wife's not listening to this. What's important to me and how can you support me? And just uh, listing those things um, so that whoever is coming in to care for this person is able to make sure that they are uh, doing things in ways that's important to them. Um, so at a, a Moving up a level, uh, looking at the ways in which services support individuals. Um, we need to find ways that we can provide a platform for groups of people or individuals to voice their opinions that will influence change at a, an organisational level. Um, so, uh, it might be about having councils uh, within a house, a ward, a day service, a school. Um, we certainly have them where we have elected chair, secretary, uh, social secretary. Um, they have elections to work out who is going to uh, take on the various roles uh, within the day, uh, the day service at New Dimensions. Another example is uh, in one of our houses where we have some people uh, who are developing uh, their independence. We have what we call huddles uh, at the four o'clock shift handover. Um, it will be attended by the three people that live in the house and the staff. And very often uh, one of us from the multidisciplinary team will uh, be part of that. The client chairs the meeting. They have a fairly set um, agenda that they follow uh, that looks at what did we do today? How did it go? Were there any problems? Were there any things that we did that we didn't like, that we want to do differently? Do we feel it was meant to be Alex turned to be uh, cleaning the bathroom, but he didn't do it and he left it for uh, Stephen to do instead. Um, do we need to uh, look at, we can look at that and to have that opportunity to, to talk about what went wrong. We make plans for tonight and for tomorrow um, and look at whose turn it is to be doing the cooking or the washing up. Tomorrow, whose turn is it perhaps to be doing the laundry uh, and so on? Another example, we're just introducing this at the moment, uh, looking at staff recruitment policy. How do we involve uh, the, our clients uh, in staff recruitment? 
um, we're, we're looking at making it uh, a requirement that all interviews, uh, all, the whole of the um, uh, staff interviewing process has a client involved um, uh, directly within it. We're using that as the first example, but then looking at uh, expanding that to more policy development. So this starts to talk about this concept of co-production, um, service users working together uh, with the people who use their services. Um, time is fast running out, so I'm not going to go over all of this, uh, but certainly in the UK, the 2014 Care Act mandates uh, co-production, um, which we've got a little way to go here yet. Um, some of the things that are required to enable good co-production, which is why it becomes, I think, very difficult to make happen all the time, is that first bit is that have to be significant cultural changes. It has to be seen as being important uh, within the organisation. People need to know exactly what it means um, and be ready to do things differently. It requires some structural changes as well. It requires um, changes to be made in how we do things. Um, people need to be trained in how to do co-production. It's not something that uh, comes automatically. Um, it's important that people develop the skills uh, to be able to listen to take on board people's views. It's not about saying that the, the client uh, is, has the power of veto over everything, but it means that uh, they have to learn as well that I might want it done this way, but actually the rest of the group want it to be done that way uh, so that um, they learn uh, how it is that, um, that uh, co-production works. And then finally, it's a requirement really that we look at reviewing what's happened and learning from it. So finally, then I want to move up to a systems level. Um, if we've got at an individual level and at a service level, we can then start looking at a, at a systems level. We've got some uh, examples where it is working um, starting to work well. Uh, Special Olympics, uh, looking at pairing uh, one of the um, uh, people from the uh, disabled person from the Special Olympics with an able-bodied person. Um, we've got uh, the Caribbean chair of the Special Olympics as part of our service. Uh, and she is developing some great skills of advocacy. But generally, we're very much on, on the starting blocks of this. Um, just one example uh, where we're perhaps just moving off the starting blocks. Uh, we were hearing from some of the people at MWI uh, that they didn't like the term service users uh, that it was being used. Um, and across the whole of the hospital, people were asked, how would you like us to refer to you? What do you want to be known as? Um, and we provided some options, uh, service user, client, um, patient, um, or if they got any other suggestions. And interestingly, some people wanted to be called patients and they happened to be people that were on the inpatient wards. They wanted to be called patients, but nearly everybody else wanted to be called clients. So that's the, the terminology that we're now using. Uh, all our policies, as they're being rewritten, um, are replacing the word service user with client. We're in the process of developing the national strategy for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, the consultation process has not involved uh, service users, clients, patients, at this point, unfortunately, um, but within, within the uh, one of the priority areas, we are looking at 
uh, developing advocacy and communication with both family carers and people with intellectual disabilities uh, being involved in the planning. We're developing uh, an accessible version, uh, which I'll give you some examples of here. Um, so this, this is still very much in draft form because we are trying to do this with some of our clients. But one of the, uh, the first part of the uh, accessible version, the heading of it is, why have we written this plan? Uh, and then we talk in fairly straightforward language um, about what are the, some of the purposes uh, of the plan. What we're then doing is, sorry, I should at this point also say we're using photo symbols and uh, Jose Lopez and the um, friends of Dame Marjorie Bean have very generously uh, purchased this package um, so that we're able to use imagery that's being created by people with intellectual disabilities for people with intellectual disabilities. So for example, on this objective, that they often have more health problems than other people in Bermuda, we're then going to be asking which of these images perhaps best captures uh, what, what it is that, um, that you want to, uh, you'd like to see portrayed um, the, the question of, they often have more health problems than other people in Bermuda. Is that the image that best captures that? Or is it one of these? Or is it one of the others from the library? So in conclusion then, um, we need to be starting at an individual level, individualized personal planning. We can then move out uh, to influencing the way that the service supports you. And then finally uh, at a systems level. So the notion of bringing the table to the people who lack a loud voice. So I will stop there. I think my time is up. Um, certainly make these resources uh, available uh, via Elisa. Um, and I will stop there and leave it to you. Fabulous. Um, before we start a discussion, I'm going to make sure I don't forget our code word this time. Um, so our code word for uh, Dr. Bush's session is fulfillment. Fulfillment is our code word. Uh, you can send that to windreach at windreach.bm with your profession in order to get your continuing education credit for this session. Um, fabulous presentation, uh, Dr. Bush. If there's anyone who has any questions in the chat, feel free to put those there. Um, I will say just so you knew, Dr. Bush, we have put a link uh, to your the video you were going to show um, in, in the chat. So they can uh, look at that if they would like on their own time. Um, but yeah, I, I really like, I'm, I'm interested and I'm glad to hear about uh, the change in are, are working toward the change in um, the word service users to clients and how that came about. Because I, I know any in, in interactions I've had with uh, Mid-Atlantic Wellness Institute, it's always been service users. So I'm glad that I can note that is no longer what people want to be referred to. Client it is. Fabulous. Now with the, um, oh, Kelly Medeiros says, me too. <laughs> But <laughs> she's glad to hear it too. All right. Um, again, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Bush, um, you can put them in the chat. Um, however, I just want to, you know, get your insight. How has it been to see um, some of these changes happen over time um, that you've been involved with this population, both in the UK and here? Um, as you were saying, you've been involved for quite a while before I even had this in the brain. Um, so I would love to get your perspective of seeing that change happen, how that's felt to you. I think for me, the biggest and most significant change uh, came about in probably uh, the 20s, early, early 20s, when we, in the UK, the, a white paper came out, uh, the first and only white paper addressing the needs 
of people uh, with an intellectual disability. And they introduced the idea of a partnership board. Um, mm -hmm. And that for me has been one of the most powerful things that I have seen. Um, it would meet about every, I think it was every month, it was co-chaired by somebody who had an intellectual disability uh, and by the uh, counsellor uh, who was responsible for uh, health uh, within the, the local council. Um, it was fascinating watching that journey uh, as people with intellectual disabilities were brought in um, to, to work, um, to influence how things happened. We'd have what were often called town hall meetings at these partnership boards. There'd be about 10, up to 20 tables um, in, the, in the town hall uh, with about six or eight people around each table. There were always two people with intellectual disabilities on that table, two carers, two family carers. And we would be discussing what is going to happen about a different aspects, day service closures, um, accessibility, uh, all sorts of issues that were important. They would also be involved in talking about uh, changes to the budget. Um, they, they might not be able to influence what happened with the budget, but they would be having a say about how money was being spent uh, and it would be transparent when things were being done differently. So that if, if the, a day service was being closed, uh, it would be brought to the partnership board to inform people what was going on, why it was happening. And there were times when the self-advocates helped to change policy uh, by influencing it. Um, so yes, uh, that, that for me, that's been one of the biggest uh, changes that I've seen in my career. Nice. Um, I, I want to ask, I'm asking all these questions, I feel like. Oh, I see Stephanie. Uh, well done, Dr. Bush presentation. Someone's cheering you on from the comment section. <laughs> um, have you seen, you know, moving or having uh, the, the group, the homes um, here in Bermuda that support individuals with intellectual disabilities moving towards these um, person-centered models. Have you seen like drastic changes come from um, those models being implemented? So say there's an individual who, you know, is showing a lot of quote unquote behavior and this model is put in place and that changes things quite drastically. The, the, biggest, the biggest change is staff teams that work together. Uh, there was one house um, that, uh, when, when I came back six years ago, where there was quite a high frequency of aggression, things getting broken, things being thrown around. Um, it's the young man that was doing it uh, had been overseas uh, to try and work out how he could be supported better, uh, come back cured. <clears throat> um, and of course that didn't quite happen, uh, but we recognized that he was autistic, um, recognized what, what the triggers were when people were invading his space, coming too close to him, there was too much noise. He couldn't make choices about uh, what he was doing. Um, we now know that he loves music. He likes to be able to control his own music. He has a radio. He breaks it once a month. Um, but that is a cheap, you know, it's probably cheaper than the medication that, uh, that otherwise might have been advocated for, uh, to be mm. used. So again, just understanding him understanding his needs and supporting the staff team. Uh, you were very fortunate having uh, a member of the psychology team who was able to spend a lot of time with him uh, and modeling good practice. Uh, he's a completely different person um, to the one that was previously being described. That description would have looked a lot different or. <laughs> Yes. 
Jessica, you have any any thoughts or any questions? Just thank you for all that you're doing to you know help promote the voices for some people who may not be able to vocalize it. Uh, so there was a question of will the slides be made available? And um, Dr. Bush, if you're okay with this, if I, if people email for their um, credits and want to request, um, I think there's a few um, individuals that we can send slides for. Um, but if, if Dr. Bush, if you're okay with that, we can send your slides to people who request them. That's that's perfect. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if there's no other questions, or if Dr. Bush, if you have anything else that you want to add? No, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to go get my water now. Hopefully you don't have as squeaky as door as I do. <laughs> um, so I'd just like to say thank you to our sponsors again for Anchor Management, Ascot, and Everest Re, um, for helping us put on this session today so that we can get, you know, um, all of these fabulous uh, speakers on board. Um,